When I was in middle school, I, had, I loved listening to rap music is where I found kind of this deep desire, and I, I just loved listening to it. And so when my teacher had assigned us to write a poem, I decided, hey, instead of writing a poem, I'm going to decide to start my rap career, and I, and I wrote a rap. And I remember what, the, she gave us all different kind of ways that we could do it, and I think, I think the whole thing was all about fruit. And so I decided, hey, I'm going to write a rap about grapes, and I thought, man, I thought I was so creative. I thought I was so funny writing this rap about grapes. And so I, you know, I showed it to my mom and I was like, hey, mom, what do you think about this? She's like, it's great. I love it. And so I turn it in and I don't hear from the teacher for a couple of days. Uh, we, were, we were tasked, like I said, with writing a poem. But I was like, hey, you know what? I'm going to take my creative liberty right now. And I'm going to write this rap. And so I turned it in. I had, I, like I said, I hadn't heard from the teacher for a couple days. And then one day she pulls me out of class and she says, hey, like, why did you, you just totally misunderstood the assignment. You like, you wrote a rap instead of a poem. And I was like, well, hey, rap music is poetry, but, and, and maybe you didn't know that, but I just kept, and I was like, hey, this, I'm, I'm going to stick true to what, to what I wanted to do. So I turn this in, I, I get pulled out of the classroom and she goes, hey, why'd you do that? You just totally misunderstood the assignment. You didn't understand that we were supposed to write a poem. And I was like, I wrote a rap. It's really funny. I think you should love it. You should give me an A. Um, and then, so she pulls me out of the class. She's like, I don't know why you did that. And then I was like, hey, I was really trying to be creative. I was trying to take the liberty that I had and use my creative freedom. And she's like, well, why can't you just be like everybody else? And I remember looking at her dead in the face and going, because I don't want to be a stick in the mud like you. Uh, <laughs> and as you can tell, as you know, if you, that did not go over too well. Um, so, so, you know, she's, she, she gets really offended. She kind of sends me back into the classroom, I called my mom, and my mom goes like, hey, uh, I heard what you said to your teacher today. And I was like, yeah, I, I did say that. And she's like, you know, I thought that I thought the, she had a conversation with my teacher. She said, I thought the rap was great. I thought it was funny. I thought he was just being creative. Like, I'm sorry that he said that to you. But that was a moment where I realized my words could start to get me in trouble. That, that the things that I say, the things that I do, the things that I, I have these interactions with people, they can start to get me into trouble. And, and for most of my life, I, I've lived and learned a little bit. But as I've gone on, I've learned, hey, you don't say things at certain times. You don't do things at certain times. You don't say certain things to certain people. But one of the, my favorite things about that is it was a moment where I got to learn. And today we're looking at a story of, of this guy named Peter. And Peter is one of Jesus' 12 disciples. He's part of the inner circle. He's, he's one of the 12. And Peter is a person who is so relatable because Peter is a person that did exactly what I did. He spoke up, he spoke out. He is the person, you, you, everyone has one in the friend group. He is the person who constantly puts his foot in his mouth. He is a person that actively always speaks out. He always has some questions to ask. And he's a person that I, I just find extremely re relatable. He's someone that I think a lot of us, we see kind of when we read his stories, when we read the stories about Peter, we see a little bit of ourselves. And Peter, he was this person who, there's a ton of stories about Peter. There are a lot of stories about him making mistakes, him messing up, him not being the perfect person that was a follower of Jesus. And I think that is why his story is so powerful. I believe that's the reason why you and I love reading stories about Peter. And there's a lot of stories that I could have chose from. But today I want to look at a story that I think can bring about a lot of confusion when we read it. I wanted to choose something that was like, hey, this is, this is interesting. I'd love to talk about it. And, but I think there's a lot of confusion that can happen when we read this story. But I also believe that this is one of the most defining moments for Peter. And I also believe it's a really defining moment for Jesus. And so as we're about to jump into the story, just a little bit of background for what is happening. Jesus has just fed 4,000 people. And he goes off with the 12, his inner group of people, and he says, hey, we're going to go across the lake. As he's crossing the lake with them, he gives them a little bit of insight, which is what he always did with the 12. Like we have, when we read the stories of Jesus, we have the disciples. That's like usually a large group of people. And then we have conversations with the 12. The 12 are always given insider information. 
And so he has this moment with the 12 and he talks about like, hey, be careful for the teachers of the law because they're going to try and come after you. You're, they're going to try and do all these things. But once they get across the lake, once they get to shore, Jesus looks at them and he wants to ask them a question. And this is the question. He says, who do people say that the son of man is? Matthew, it's Matthew 16, 13 through 15. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, what do you say about me? So basically he asked the disciples, hey, what are, what, what's the vibe out there? What are people saying about me? Maybe you've done this before. You're trying to, you know, talk to other people and you're like, hey, what are people saying about the things that I'm doing? And they have a very just kind of candid response for him. He says, there's, there's a lot of talk. He's either John the Baptist, he might be Elijah come back to life, he might be Jeremiah, he might be a prophet, but he doesn't want to know what everyone else is saying. He wants to know, he wants to ask the 12, what do you say? What do you think? You've been around me, you've been walking with me, you've been talking with me, what do you say? And then this is, we, we get a response. And of course, Peter is the one who answers Jesus' question. This is what we read in uh, verse 16. It said, Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. So Peter answers the question, and here's the thing. Peter gets it right. Rarely does he get it right. But Peter gets it right in this moment. And Jesus is like, okay, like he he understands. Peter gets it right. He's the first one to speak up. And everyone had ideas of who Jesus was. Like we had those couple descriptions. Like everyone had ideas of who this guy was. But Peter's the one who just goes, yes, and gets it. He gets it right. He, he, he says, Jesus is the Messiah. Peter is known, like I said before, as the disciple who always speaks up, which also makes him the disciple who sticks his foot in, the, in his mouth all the time. But Peter gets it right in this instance. He finally nails it on the head. And then Jesus has a response for him in verses 17 and 18. This is what we read. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. So imagine this. Peter gets it right, and immediately Jesus says, Peter, good job. Now Peter, now Jesus is casting vision for Peter. He's saying, Peter, these are all the amazing things you're going to do. Peter, you are going to build my church. You are going to do these amazing things. You're going to be the cornerstone. The gates of hell will not stop this. He's giving them this, this vision, this powerful vision of what Peter is going to do. He's saying, you are going to do great things, Peter. You see, Jesus tells them that he would no longer be called Simon, but Peter. And whenever we read in scripture and someone's renamed, it usually has a lot of significance. It usually means that they're going to start living out their true calling as who God has called them to be. And so when Peter is is renamed right here, he is given a new identity. He is this person who's going to establish the church. Peter's new identity was to be the cornerstone. He was going to be this person that did amazing things for God. He was going to do all this stuff for the church. And here's the thing that I find so ironic about this. Peter hasn't done anything significant. He's at, at this point... He's just a follower of Jesus. He's just one of the 12. He's just a disciple. He hasn't done anything significant. And here we have Jesus just casting vision, speaking prophetically to Peter and saying, Peter, you are going to go out and you're going to do these amazing things. You're going to go out and you're going to do these awesome things in my name. You're going to go out and do all this stuff. Peter has been this person who has just been speaking up and speaking out. He hasn't done anything significant. You see, Jesus is suggesting that Peter is going to be the cornerstone of the new kingdom that Jesus came to establish. He's going to be the person who starts the movement. He's going to be the person who goes out and establishes the church. He's going to be this person that the gates of hell will not even stop what Peter's going to do. That the gates of hell, that, that death itself will not reign because Jesus has overcome the world. And Peter is going to be the vessel that God is working through. Peter is going to be the person that God has used is, and is going to use to do great things. Like, ima- like imagine that you're given by the Son of God this huge task, this gigantic task. And Jesus continues on. He gives him even more vision of what the future is going to look like. This is what he says. 
He says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. So basically, Jesus continues on and he says, Peter, whatever you want to hold tightly on earth, that's me held tight in heaven. And whatever you want to hold loosely on earth, whatever you want to be relaxed about, that's going to be relaxed about in heaven. So Jesus is giving Peter so much authority. Remember, he's done nothing up until this point. He gives him so much authority. He gives him oh, this, this vision has been casted. He's given to speak words of life to people. He'll be the one to lead people into the kingdom. And right after this, Jesus tells Peter, hey, don't tell anybody. Don't tell anyone that I'm a Messiah. You see, so Peter gets it right, but Jesus doesn't want anyone to know that he's the Messiah because there's this thing, if you've read scripture before, maybe you've heard of it, it's called the messianic secret. That Jesus doesn't want anybody to know that he's the Messiah because then they're gonna put all these expectations on him. That they're gonna want Jesus to do this and do that and go out and do all these things. They're gonna, that there's this idea that the Messiah was gonna go out and do like, create a physical kingdom. And so when Jesus tells his disciples to not tell anyone, this is, this is one of those things where Jesus is saying, hey, don't tell anyone because you're going to spoil it. It's going to mess the whole thing up if you tell anyone. People will put all these expectations on him. And because, he announced, because Peter announces that Jesus is Messiah to this small group, they already have ideas of what that means for them. I mean, if we're following the Messiah, then we're going we're gonna to be sitting at the right hand of God. If we're following the Messiah, if we're listening to this Messiah, we're going to have a front row seat to what's going to happen. But let's keep reading and go on. It says, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. So this is not the kind of Messiah that you want to follow. Because Jesus is saying, hey, here's what's ahead. The road ahead isn't going to be fun. It's going to be gnarly. It's going to be crazy. You want to know what's on the forefront for us? Suffering and death. Like as we go to Jerusalem, as they're making their way towards the final journey of Jerusalem, here's what's ahead. Death, suffering, but also resurrection. He's giving them a taste of what it's going to look like in the future. Basically, Jesus tells these disciples, hey, it's not going to be easy, guys. It's going to be really hard. It's going to be rough. That this isn't going to be a fun experience for me. It's not going to be a fun experience for you because when people find out that you're following me, they're going to come after you too. But here's the thing. This is not the type of Messiah that Peter wants to follow. This is not the type of Messiah that a good Jew would want to follow because the Messiah was supposed to come in and, and Rome was the superpower that they, the Messiah was supposed to come in, overthrow Rome, literally rip the emperor off his throne, establish the throne, sit on the throne, and create peace through the empire, create peace for the Israelite people. But Jesus doesn't promise any of that. Jesus doesn't say, hey, I'm going to come in, I'm going to like rip these people to shreds, and I'm going to sit on my physical throne. Because Jesus, what he's talking about, he's not talking about a physical kingdom. He's talking about a kingdom, a new kingdom, a new type of way of living. And Peter can't get that. He can't understand that. He's confused. He's lost by that idea. Jesus wants the people, the, the 12, to know that their idea of a Messiah that they have is totally incorrect. It's totally wrong. And Peter speaks up about this as usual, and this is what we read in verse 22. It says, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Basically, Jesus, or Peter takes Jesus aside and like shakes him and is like, no, that's not who you're supposed to be. The Messiah is supposed to come and he's going to change the world. He's going to do all these amazing things. It's not about suffering and death. It's about establishing the throne. And so Peter takes him aside and he starts yelling at him. Like, Jesus, that's not who you are. That's not who you're going to be. That's not what we're looking for. Peter gets upset because he doesn't want Jesus to go through all of that. Suffering, death. Jesus isn't supposed to go through those things as the Messiah. 
He doesn't want to see his friend suffer. He doesn't want to see his friend die. And so he rebukes him and pulls him aside and says, Jesus, that's not who you are. That's not going to happen to you. Basically, Peter's saying, I won't let that happen to you. Let me be, like, let me be your bodyguard. Let me be the person. He wants Jesus to stick it to the Romans. He wants Jesus to take the emperor off the throne. He wants Jesus to take the throne and establish peace and justice. Now, here's the thing. Peter wants physical, like what he can see, peace and justice. That's what Peter's fighting for. Peter is fighting for peace and justice in the way that you and I think about peace and justice. He's not thinking about it in the way that God brings about peace and justice. He's looking at this and going, man, like, if Jesus, when Jesus establishes the throne, like, dude, we're going to be chilling. We're going to be good. We're gonna, it's going to be fun. Like, but Jesus wants to remind Peter, Peter that's, not, that's not who I am. I'm not here to establish a physical kingdom. You see, if Jesus was really God in the flesh, this is what the disciples are thinking, and and God cares about injustice, God is going to act and do something about it. God is going to act. God is going to establish his throne. God is going to do something good. But for them, it's all about the physical. They're not thinking about what God is going to do through Jesus. So after after, uh, Peter pulls Jesus aside, now it's Jesus' turn to rebuke Peter. And this is what we read in in this, this next verse. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. So he looks at, you know, he Peter rebukes Jesus and says, That's not who you are. And Jesus looks at Peter and goes, Peter, know your place. Basically, what 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 Jesus tells Peter, he says, You can either get behind me. And follow me, or you're out. You can either get behind me, follow the things that I'm calling you to, or you're done, Peter. You don't have to be part of the 12. You don't have to be part of this movement. He, so, so he says, get behind me, Satan. You're in the way. He calls him a stumbling block. He's like, Jesus is like, I'm going to charge. And if you are in the way, you're going to be my stumbling block. You're going to get in the way. You're going to get in the way of what God is doing right here and right now. It's this interesting interaction where, where Peter rebukes Jesus and then Jesus is like, hey, I'm going to bring the fire onto you. Like, I'm going to rebuke you back. And here's why. Because Peter doesn't understand the vision. Rather than being the rock of the church that, that Peter was supposed to be, he has become the stumbling block that gets in the way. Rather than being the person who's the cornerstone, he's the stone in the way. He's the person that is in the way of what Jesus is trying to do. You see, what is interesting, though, is I think in our own lives, we've been that for someone else. You see, maybe you've been at dinner or, or coffee or in a conversation with a friend, and they were going through it, and you spoke life to them. You shared with them. You just said, hey, I, I get what you're going through. I get that, that that life is difficult right now. I get that life is hard. And so, like, whatever you need, just, just hit me up. I got you. Like, I'll, I'll take care of you. And you've spoken life into someone, or maybe someone was going to do something super ambitious, and you're like, hey, I I think you could nail that. I think you could crush that. I think you could do a good job with that. And you've been life-giving, and you've been someone that, that was encouraging, and really a person that championed their idea. But also, we've been the other person, right? We've been Peter. We said, don't do that. Don't say that. It's too risky. Please stop. And so we've been a stumbling block to maybe what God was doing in their life. Maybe they felt like they had been given this divine direction to go out and start something and do something new. And we discourage them from it. We discourage them from what God was calling them to do. We discourage them from something that God had put on their heart. And here's the thing. Peter is doing that same thing when he rebukes Jesus. He's looking at Jesus and saying, hey, I know you have a vision for what your future is going to look like, but I don't want to be part of that vision. I don't want to be part of what you're doing because it sounds really gnarly, Jesus. You see, in the world that Peter and Jesus lived in, Satan was seen as this figure who was against God. 
That when Jesus calls Peter Satan, he's not literally saying that in that moment, you know, Peter's dressed up in red, he's got a pitchfork. It, that's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, Peter, the reason why you're, I'm calling you Satan right now, the reason why you are being called Satan is because you are actively going against what God is doing. You are actively fighting back on what God wants to do in this world. You are actively going against what God is calling me to. You see, so when Jesus calls Peter Satan, it's not because he doesn't have the concerns of, it has, it's because he has the concerns of God, not at the forefront, but he has human concerns. He's worried about what does that mean if Jesus, this Messiah, dies? What does that mean if Jesus, this Messiah, is not who I think he is? Maybe you've been in a meeting before and someone just like crushed your idea. Ah, that's stupid or that's dumb. Maybe you've said some harsh words to somebody. Maybe you said some words like, hey, that, 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 that idea is idiotic. That idea is not smart. But I want you to think, like, I don't think any of us would step up in a meeting and be like, you don't understand the vision. Get behind me, Satan. Like, I, I, I mean, it's kind of funny when you think about it, but it's like, it's harsh at the same time. Like, you are actively going against what I'm doing. And Jesus is saying, Peter, you're actively going against what God wants. I may be called someone dumb or stupid or, or maybe something I can't say up here, but I've never called someone Satan. I've never looked someone in the eyes and said, get behind me, Satan. But I think I need to clarify what that even means. Peter is literally called the vehicle that Satan is working through. In the Old Testament, specifically the book of Job, we find out that Satan is called this accuser. That the Satan is this prosecuting attorney and if you've read Job before, you know it's God and, God and this Satan going at it with each other, asking questions, asking questions to one another. And it's this accuser, this person that is going against what God is doing. And that's where Peter's at. He's actively going against what God wants to do. Scholars have, and commentators have suggested that this goes even further, that Peter isn't just an adversary to Jesus at this point, that Peter has been influenced by the forces of darkness, that he has been influenced by the, the forces of darkness at work. And Paul talks about this in, in the book of Ephesians. He calls it the rulers of the air. And he says, forces of darkness are at work against us. Forces of darkness are working against what God wants to do, that the Satan is this prosecuting attorney. And here's the thing, G Peter is so blinded by his own ideas of Jesus that he can't even see that this Messiah is right in front of him. He can't even see that there's this person right in front of him. And I want you to imagine Peter in that moment, the weightiness of those words that Jesus said to him. And I remember when I was in high school, a chemistry teacher, I, I was taking chemistry and I was just lost. Like chemistry and, and science is just like not my thing. And so I, I was really lost and I was texting my friends every day being like, dude, like, and you send me the homework, you know? I was like trying, I was trying to understand it as hard as I could. Like I was putting in so much work. And one day I just walked up to the teacher and I go, hey, I don't get this. I don't understand this. I'm really lost here and I just need some help. And she looked at me and she's like, you know, it's like baking cookies. And I'm like, baking cookies is fun. Like baking cookies is, and she's like, it's like a science. Like it's like, you know, you take the flour, you take, and I'm like, no, 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 like, this is confusing and I'm lost and I think I'm just going to drop the class. And she looked at me, high school kid, and goes, if you don't know how to do chemistry, you'll be nothing in life. You will be a failure. You will be like, she basically just looked at me and said like, you're a failure. You're going to be nothing in life because you don't know how to do this. And I remember those words like stuck with me, not the fact that it was just like chemistry that I didn't understand, but I remember like walking home, like going, going home from school that day and like thinking about that. Like, man, like this teacher just like wrecked me, just like destroyed me and told me I would never be anything in life, that I wouldn't be good at anything in life. And those words, they stuck with me. Those words hit me so hard that I like really wrestled with those words when I failed at stuff that I wasn't good at. When I messed up in college, when my 
when my papers weren't perfect, when I didn't understand something perfectly, when I started working in ministry and an event failed or something like that. I remember those words, you are a failure, you will be nothing. I remember I walked with those words for a while. I walked with those words because they hurt. And maybe you walked in today and you had some words that, that were said to you. It could have been I don't, in high school. It could have been a teacher. It could have been a coach. It could be your spouse that maybe said something. And you're holding on to this anger and this bitterness and this resentment. And it's, and it's, just, it's just killing you. That it's these words that were said have had such an impact. Maybe it's even steered you away from trying something new before. Maybe you're like, I don't even want to try anything new because I don't want to fail. Maybe you're walking around and you're carrying that bitterness, that anger, that resentment with you every single place you go. And you're wondering why, why you're so frustrated or angry all the time. And maybe you just haven't dug down deep enough and asked, what is the root of this? You see, every time Peter failed, I, must, I imagine that he must have replayed those words in his mind, get behind me, Satan. I have to believe that Peter carried that with him everywhere he went. Every single time he messed up, every t- single time he failed, he probably walked with those words, and those words stuck with him. I mean, the Messiah, his, his Savior, had told him, get behind me, Satan. When, when he denied Jesus, I imagine those words hit him. When, he's, when he sees Jesus die on the cross, those words probably hit him. That Peter, as he goes on, as they make the journey to Jerusalem, he remembers all those, those harsh words that were said. And here's the thing. He spoke a lot of life. Jesus spoke a lot of life to him. Je- Jesus said, hey, you're going to establish the church. You're going to be the cornerstone. You're going to do these amazing things. But he doesn't even hear those words because of what Jesus said to him. He doesn't even hear the life that Jesus was preaching to him. He doesn't hear the things that God was doing in and through him. It didn't matter that Jesus renames him. It doesn't matter that Jesus had spoken all these things. He could just remember the harsh words. But we do the same thing. No matter how many times someone praises us, no matter how many times someone speaks words of life into us, we always hear the negative comments. No matter how much our boss says, man, you crushed that project. We remember the one time that our boss yelled at us. No matter how many times our spouse says that they love us, We remember that one time when they said they didn't want to be with us. Or maybe your kids have spoken words to you. Maybe it was when they were really young and they said they hated you. And you're still walking with that. You see, the words that you and I speak to one another have impact. And a few things that I think you and I can learn from Peter. There's two things. Being a follower of Jesus means living and learning. Being a follower of Jesus means living and learning. And here's the thing. We're going to get it wrong sometimes. And that's okay. But I would like, it's okay that we get it wrong. It's okay that we mess up because Jesus doesn't ask us, hey, come to me when you're perfect. Come to me when you figured everything out. And I think sometimes we think that. We think, man, we have to have it figured all out before we approach Jesus. But here's the thing. Being a disciple, being a follower, just like Peter, it means we're going to get it wrong. It means that we're going to mess up. You see, Peter ultimately had to get to a place, though, where he was like, you know what? I have to accept this. I'm going to get it wrong. I'm going to mess up. I'm going to say things that aren't right. I'm going to do things that aren't right. So Peter, he had to work through what this meant for him. You see, after Jesus dies and resurrects, he meets Peter on the shore. And, Peter, and uh, Jesus cooks Peter breakfast. And Jesus asks him three times, because he denied Jesus three times. Hey, Peter, do you love me? He asks him that three times, and every single time, Peter says, Lord, you know that I love you. You know that I love you so much. And I remember, I can imagine that moment on the beach had to be painful. That moment had to be painful because he was confronting the ways that he failed. He was confronting the things that he had done wrong. And there's that moment where Jesus says, hey, when you, like he said, after he says I love you, he says, Peter, go. Just go. Go off and remember the things that I spoke to you. Remember the life that I spoke to you. Remember that I called you the cornerstone of the church. Our relationship with Jesus 
just like Peter's, always offers us a second chance and a third chance and a fourth chance and a fifth chance. Jesus is all about offering us grace when we mess up. And I think that is so powerful for Peter's life because he experienced it. You see, what's powerful is when you and I can experience the grace and forgiveness that God has has given us. And I want to fast forward to the book of Acts when the church is kind of establishing and it's kind of confusing because the, the 12 are in this room and a rushing wind comes in. And they start to hear all these different languages. They start to hear all these different words that are spoken in different languages. There's this violent wind that triumphs and comes through and people start speaking different things. Then, who do you think? Of course he does. Peter stands up and he starts to preach. He starts to preach this message and he starts to share, hey, Jesus was the Messiah. He was killed. He was raised. He is resurrected. He offers forgiveness to each and every one of you. Like Peter preaches this beautiful message. It's in, it's in Acts 2 if you ever want to read it. It's beautiful. And Peter knows this forgiveness because he's experienced it. And here's the thing, I think it's so powerful. Sometimes we're like, man, I really want my friends to come to church. I really want maybe maybe, uh, family to come to church. And you're like, I don't know how to share with people. Man, just share how God has forgiven you. Share how God has changed your life. That's exactly what Peter did. And as a result of sharing that message, this is what we read about Peter in Acts 2.41. This is what we read. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their, daily, their number that day. 3,000 people. Peter gets up, he preaches this beautiful message, he preaches this amazing message and people are like, man, like, I want to follow this God. I want to be in relationship with this God. Forgiveness for Peter was a lived experience and because it was a lived experience, that's the reason why his message was so powerful. He had experienced forgiveness himself. He understood what it meant to follow Jesus and experience the goodness of God. And you and I, we might know that. That maybe we're holding on to this bitterness, we're holding on to this anger, this this resentment that we have, and, and Jesus offers us a chance to let that go. Maybe you feel bad for days, weeks, months, years, and we walk with this pain. And Peter wrote a letter to this group of individuals who was experiencing difficulty for following Jesus. And ultimately, this is where Peter gets. This is what I think is so impactful. He says this in 1 Peter 5, 7. This is what he says. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. What Peter is saying is that when you have burdens, when you have things that you're holding on to, You can give that to Jesus. He wants it. I think sometimes we think our problems are too big for Jesus to handle. Here's the thing. Jesus wants your problems. Peter had to get to this place. Maybe he had to work through his own pain, his struggles, his self-confidence to get there. It's a process, but he finally learned what it meant to give everything up, to let go of the pain maybe that he felt, to trust that when Jesus said, Peter, I forgive you, And I want you to be part of this. Peter had to believe that. And so for for us today, I think it it, it makes me want to ask this question and and have us wrestle with this question. Is what are you holding on to that you need to give to God? Like, what are you holding on to? Is it, is it anger? Is it, for, is it, are you holding on or holding out forgiveness because it feels good, because you're in the power position now? What are you holding on to? Anger, bitterness, rage. Here's the thing. When we lay those things at Jesus' feet, they lose their power. When we hand those things over, they lose their power over us. Are things gonna hurt? Yeah, they're gonna be difficult. You see, holding on feels good a lot of the time. It makes us feel justified. It makes us feel right. Peter was able to work through the pain and suffering. And what did he experience on the other side? He experienced life, a full life. You see, Jesus wants a full life for you. Jesus wants you to experience his love and forgiveness right now. That love and forgiveness that Peter was given, that wasn't just something for Peter. That was, that's something for all of us. That God wants you to experience life and life to the full now. Jesus can take your pain, your guilt, your shame, and he wants you to step into grace. He wants you to experience love. Don't let the things of the past define who you are. 
what you said, what you did. Jesus wants to redeem those things and make you feel whole. You and I will experience life when we do this. Peter knew that. You know that. I know that. We will experience life when we hand those things over. Would you guys pray with me? God, I thank you for our time together today. The ways that we get to just come to you. God, I pray for each and every one of us that we would be able to let go of something we've been holding on to. God, we know it's, it's easier to hold on. It's, it, it's more fun. It's more justifying to hold on. But God, that's not what you call us to do. You call us to experience your grace. You call us to experience life. And God, we want people to experience that so badly. God, I pray for, for any of us holding on to something, wrestling with something, God, that we would be able to lay that at your feet. God, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.